the Hamera is back, this time on the CR10 Max. There's no loss of build volume and it's capable of fast, big, flexible prints. Recently, I fitted the E3D Hamera to the Ender 3. It did print well, but there was some build volume lost and it was quite expensive relative to the cost of the printer. This time, I fitted it to this CR10 Max, using a combination of parts from the community as well as some that I've developed myself for a rigid install with no loss of build volume. Furthermore, I've installed it with a Volcano Hot End and 0.6mm nozzle. So now I can print big, fast and flexible. Last time I went methodically through the process, but this time I'll focus more on the specifics of this install. One note before we begin, this should be 90% compatible with the CR10S Pro because many of the parts are shared and it has the same firmware source. Let's quickly recap what the Hamera is and then get started. The Hamera is the latest and greatest from E3D. Firstly, it's dual drive, just like a Bontech extruder. Only two bolts to see inside and we can see the two meshing drive gears ready to go. The filament tension arm is also adjustable. One of the main innovations is a custom NEMA 17 stepper motor inbuilt to the design. And we can see this here with the output shaft having the cog in place. And for me, one of the coolest things is this heat sink here, developed with computational fluid dynamics to provide optimum cooling and blowing all of the air away from the bed and hot end. On the Ender 3, it did print quite well easily printing the softest TPU I had at 80 millimeters per second. But on the Ender 3, it was absolutely huge. And we did lose around 26 millimeters of Y volume. The CR10 Max is a better fit because it's much bigger and more expensive. Since my review, I've done some minor upgrades. The big heavy bed suffered from wobble on the springs, so I replaced them with these solid mounts from TH3D. When I was filming my maintenance video, I noticed that the path for the bed wires was less than ideal and these were rubbing on the frame and starting to fray. So I extended the wiring that goes into this loom and I installed a cable chain to keep things tidy and safe from now on. On to my Hamera install and step one for me was swapping the V6 hot end for a Volcano hot end and E3D does have a guide for doing just this. It's pretty straightforward and we start by undoing the nozzle and then unscrewing the old heater block Obviously the thermistor and the heater have already been removed and we insert the new ones from the side with all of the cutouts and notches. This grub screw should be tight but not so much it crushes the cartridge. The heater cartridge also inserts from this end but this time we can do up the two screws quite tightly. Having the heater come out mid print is one of the most dangerous fire hazards a 3D printer can have. Now the Volcano sub-assembly can be screwed back onto the heat break that's in the middle of the Hermera so now it's time to select our nozzle. There's a reference on the E3D store page that explains the size of the nozzle opening is dependent on the amount of dots on the side. I went for 0.6 millimeters. Whatever your selected nozzle is, screws the whole way in, but only finger tight will do a hot tighten later on. If you're using the fan that comes with the kit, now's the time to install it. The two screws should be tight, but not so much that they warp the body of the fan. Now I'm doing my wiring differently in that I'm going to reuse what I can from the factory setup. We need to do some disassembly to get to the wiring. This is very straightforward. We simply undo bolts and remove components as we see them. The CR10 Max comes with a factory BL touch. And of course we will reuse the wiring for this. With everything removed, here's my plan. I'm going to reuse the 24 volt heater cartridge because as you can see here, it's identical in size. The thermistor however, isn't compatible. So I'm going to cut and solder on the plug right onto the factory wiring. The heatsink fans are exactly the same size. The one from E3D is ball bearing and a little bit nicer, but to save some hassle, I'll use the Creality one again. The part cooling blower fan unfortunately doesn't fit the duct that I've printed for this setup. So instead, I'm using a cheap eBay blower fan with a link in the description to an example of what will fit. I'm going to cut and crimp in some DuPont connectors so I can remove and change this later on if need be. For these printers, there's a ribbon cable up to this breakout board on the end of the x-axis gantry. We need to remove this plate and move all of the wiring around the frame to the front of the printer. The extruder stepper wire is very short and plugs into here. This makes wiring up the Hamera stepper so much easier. We're going to use the black cable that comes with the kit. 
and with the black wire facing outwards, we're going to plug it straight back into the port where we pulled out the factory short wire. It won't seat anywhere near as nice as factory, so use some hot glue, or in my case blue tack to stop it from vibrating free. Reusing parts this way made the wiring conversion on this printer much easier to do. Now onto the meat of my project, designing and printing mounting parts. I was really happy with the part cooling fan duct from the previous video, so I printed the Volcano version from the same thing. Previously on the Ender 3 install, I was unhappy with the bulk and weight of all the printed parts required to get the Homera adapted. I also showed you the work of one of my patrons Patrick, who had made a custom alloy mount for his CR10S Pro. Since then, he's released this on Thingiverse, so if you have access to alloy machining facilities, follow the link in the description for the nicest part possible. My first job in emulating this was to strip down the X carriage and then measure everything up and do a basic model in CAD. I then printed a simple one millimeter thick panel to test if my measurements were correct. You can see I was about half a millimeter off on a couple of the bolts. So I made the adjustments and on the second time round, everything fit quite well. This gave me a good base to expand upon. Fortunately, detailed drawings of both the Hamera and the BL Touch are available from their creators on their websites. Version 3 built upon this with more complexity, but also introduced proposed mounting holes for the Hamera, except I had to abandon this placement because the holes hang off the edge. Version 4 was what I ended up going with. The Hamera will be held on with 4 bolts, with 3 out of 4 being secured against the metal carriage. The final design has three easy to print without support parts to adapt the Hamera onto the factory carriage. There's a post with holes for cable management, a mount for the BL touch out the front, and a stopper on the back to hit the X axis end stop in the correct position. There's also a cable management piece to help guide the wiring from the breakout board to the Hamera. The link for these parts is available in the description below. With the mounting parts ready, it's time for the physical install. If you remove two bolts from the back of the right hand side of the X gantry, you'll be able to flex it outwards and assuming you've removed the belt tensioner, you'll be able to take the carriage off in one piece. You'll want the adapter plate to fit as snugly as possible. So orient it as shown and use the mounting lugs for the factory hot end to position it in place. You'll notice that the lower left slot has a slightly larger side and we're gonna put a bolt through that just to hold everything in place. Tight enough a nut on this bolt and then slide everything into position to get it as parallel as possible to the factory carriage. Now comes the scary bit. We're gonna use the upper two holes as a template for drilling into the metal plate. Be careful for the upper left that you don't go too far and damage the V-roller behind. Use a three millimeter drill bit and try and keep the drill as perpendicular as possible. Once the two holes are done, Take your time in cleaning up all of the aluminium shavings. We don't want anything falling into the electronics or cutting grooves in the V rollers. With everything cleaned up and our adapter plate back in place, we can see we're gonna use all four mounting locations of the Hamera with three of them supported by metal. It's now time to mount our Hamera. Carefully align it with the mounting holes and drop in a square M3 nut into the lower right position and secure this with an M3 by eight bolt. M3 by 10 is used for the other three and you should be able to torque all of these up quite tight, giving a really rigid mount. Don't forget to insert another square nut when doing the upper right hole. For the two right hand locations, it's handy because we can see the engagement of the bolt with the nut in the end of the Homera. Next up, you need to take the fan and mount it so the wiring faces straight up. If you're reusing the Creality fan like me, you'll find the screws need to go further in. Be careful not to slip and strip the end of them. Again, make sure they're tight, but not so tight that the casing for the fan is flexed and distorted. We now need to temporarily unplug the BL Touch, collect the printed BL Touch mount, and pre-prepare two M3x12mm bolts. They're going to go through the lug on the left-hand side, and then we take the end stop plate and align it on the rear. As you screw in the two bolts, you're going to cut your own thread, so make sure they're firm, but don't over tighten and strip out the plastic completely. Now we're going to take the BL Touch, and with a little bit of angling, you should be able to fit it up from underneath and into its correct place. I'd highly recommend plugging back in the cable before you bolt it into place, as the space becomes tight and it's much more fiddly to do this. 
You can reuse the factory bolts here. I'm using M3x8 with a cap head just to stay consistent with all of my other mounting hardware. The next step is to take the thermistor plug coming from the hot end and connect it up to the soldered in cable. The connector is a little bit bulky but there should be a nice place for it just behind the BL touch. The only thing left is the part cooling fan. So I plug in my DuPont connector and you can see I already have this blower fan completely assembled onto the mount and duct including square nuts on the end so I can slide it into the side mounts of the Homera. Now comes one of the fiddliest parts, using a cable tie onto the supplied post to hold the end of the loom firmly in the correct position. Here's my final solution and you can see I introduced a second cable tie to hold the wiring clear of the heatsink fan. I then plugged in the Homera extruder cable and cable tied this to the existing loom the whole way along at around 10 centimeter intervals. You should hopefully find that if you untangle the cables on the left hand side and guide the loose x-axis belt between the v-rollers that the wiring is just long enough to allow the whole assembly to slide back on to the right hand side of the x-axis extrusion. You can now reattach the belt and bolt this right hand side back together. The wiring on the left hand side however is still quite messy. We're going to remove the top two bolts that cover the x-stepper and insert three cable ties as shown here. This cable management part is attached with two M3 by 50 millimeter bolts. We now pull the cables through as tight as we can without putting on undue strain and use the cable ties to secure them in place. If everything's gone well, that should allow free movement of the carriage the whole way to the right hand side without anything getting snagged. We're ready to tweak our firmware and there isn't too much to do, but because this is a Creality printer with the new touchscreen, our approach is slightly different. We need to use a specially maintained branch of Marlin 2.0 by Insanity Automation and sponsored by Tiny Machines 3D. Download the zip from the direct link in the description below. After you download the zip, inside the Marlin folder will be the marlin.ino which you can open in the Arduino IDE. And there's also a zip file, CR10S Pro Max Ender 5 Plus V2 screen. And inside here is a folder called D1 Set that we use to flash the touchscreen. This process is the same as the CR10S Pro, which I've covered in a specific video before. This version of Marlin is set up like TH3D, where we uncomment some simple things at the top to configure for our machine. The first being to uncomment machine CR10 Max, or if you're doing a CR10S Pro, uncomment that instead. We're gonna scroll down and uncomment Hot End E3D, Hot End All Metal, E3D Hemera, and Direct Drive. We'll keep scrolling and uncomment ABL BL Touch, as well as Force 10S Pro Display, which makes the firmware talk to the touchscreen. A little bit below this, we're going to uncomment ABL underscore BI, and we're also going to uncomment Define Mesh Standard. I customize the BL Touch probing, speeding it up by commenting out extra probing. I also found that the X bed size was set to 475, and I needed to reduce this to 450, to prevent collisions during probing. I also found I was getting false positives for filament runout unless I set the filament runout distance to 10. Once these changes are made, we come up to tools, select Arduino Mega 2560, our COM port, and then click upload. No bootloader required. A reminder to also update the firmware for the touchscreen, and once that's successful, the interface should look like this. Onto our final calibration, and much of this is the same as the Ender 3 video, so I'm going to keep it brief. We start with the hot tighten of the nozzle, which means manually heating it up to 300 degrees. Leave it for a while for all the temperature stabilize, support the heating block with a spanner, and then tighten the nozzle. We can remove one bolt from the filament holder, rotate it 90 degrees, and move it to the middle of the printer. Thanks to the plate designed into my mount, the x-axis should home in the correct position, with the nozzle just over the edge of the bed. The y-axis, however, will be approximately 10 millimeters out. Fortunately, we can undo the plug and then the bolt holding it in place, and then using a spare T-nut and little bolt, move it forward approximately 10 millimeters. There seems to be around 470 millimeters of travel from factory, so even after losing this 10 millimeters, we still retain the full 450 millimeters on the y. E3D generally recommend lowering the V-Ref for your stepper motor drivers. 
However, I noticed the old stepper and the new one for the extruder are more or less the same size. So I've left it as is, but I'll be monitoring the temperature to make sure it doesn't get too hot. We're now going to plug into the printer and connect to a terminal with software like Pronterface. The first thing we need to do is to tell it where the BL touch is, and that's M851X-40Y0. After this, we'll start a PID auto-tune with M303S200U1. This will take around 5 to 10 minutes, and when it's done, simply put in M500 to store both of these settings. We'll do our final tuning of the E-steps, and this is also something I've covered before, so we'll do it quickly here. With some light colored filament, we're gonna get a ruler and mark 120 millimeters above the end of our PTFE tubing. Back in Pronterface, with the nozzle up to temp, we're gonna set the distance and the speed at 100, and then click Extrude. The marked filament will very slowly get drawn in, and afterwards, you can measure the distance to the mark, you're aiming for 20 millimeters, mine is 18, which means I over extruded by two millimeters. So in summary, I wanted 100 millimeters, I actually got 102, and my old E-steps were 400. Put these numbers into the formula, and my new E-steps should be 392. Back in Pronterface, I can enter M92, E392 for my new steps, press enter, and then M500 to save. Calibration is done, so let's tweak our slicer. There's really only two things we need to change. They should be pretty simple to find in any slicer. Firstly, now that we're direct drive, our attraction distance will be something like one millimeter before we tune it. With all of this done, I did some simple test prints. Doing these cubes at 0.4 millimeter layer height, which suits my 0.6 millimeter nozzle nicely. As you can see, I tested filament runout protection as well. My real test, however, was this baby Manticore at 0.4mm layer height in TPU. I didn't put any effort into tuning the retraction first, so the stringing's pretty bad, but I should be able to burn or cut that off later on. It's got two perimeters and zero infill, so it turned out pretty good considering that. This is definitely the biggest flexible item that I've ever 3D printed. This time around, I'm much happier with the install. It's rigid, tidy, and I haven't lost any build volume. The Hamera is a good fit for this machine, and with my Volcano nozzle set, I can go all the way up to 1.2mm for ultra big prints. Plus, I've got a bunch of leftover part that might go nicely as upgrades on other machines. On my to-do list is to remount the filament runout sensor. It's definitely a welcome addition when you're doing long large prints that use more than one spool of filament. Special thanks must go out to Automated Insanity and Tiny Machines 3D that lets us modify and upgrade these printers without losing compatibility with the factory touchscreen. If you've got any thoughts or comments on how this install went, or if it gave you any ideas on how you'd like to do it to your own printer, please let me know down below in the comment section. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, happy 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.